we got seven different stories from seven different media outlets, you guys. It's time for another episode of Regan's News Round. Let's go. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. This is Regan Elite here with another episode of Regan's News Round, where I cover seven different stories from seven different media outlets. The time of this recording is the 28th of March at around 7.30 in the morning, just for reference, in case any of these stories that I cover are updated by the time of recording. And we start with The Guardian with the headline here of, You've got to be joking! Mandelson dismisses the prospect of the UK rejoining the EU. The Labour peer says there is little desire amongst voters for a referendum and in Brussels for renegotiations. So uh, before we read into this uh, silly little man's comments, uh, because they are, uh, he is a silly little man with silly little comments, I will say that um, the prospect of the UK rejoining the EU, it's not rejoining it'll be joining the eu um, i'm not going to use the term rejoining because it will be a very long time before uh any kind of serious discussion about that happens about joining the european union but it will happen at some point in the future um, but anyone who is saying that it's going to be happening within the next few years or in the next five years let's just like just let's be realistic for for uh, about the prospects there is a lot, a lot, a lot of work to do, and we need to sort out our own house in terms of politics here. And there needs to be obviously a a high proportion of people amongst the whole the whole of the UK. We know Scotland's position is that they would rather be in the EU. Uh, Northern Ireland obviously didn't want. Uh, Northern Ireland obviously will eventually, I believe, be part of the European Union once uh, at some point if they unify with with Ireland. Um, Wales did vote to leave, but obviously that was um, some of them obviously feel betrayed by Brexit, as does people in England. There is a there is a desire from uh, the, from some of the British public to have that discussion, but not right now. Uh, but they will want that discussion in the future. But considering some of the the issues that are surrounding being outside the single market and customs union is definitely playing a factor into the into those talks. But for the Labour peer, uh, say Labour peer basically saying there's n there's no prospect of the UK rejoining the EU, not right now is my answer. But at some point in the future, I think there will be, um, but not hopefully before my before the end of my lifetime. And I I do believe that will happen within the next perhaps fifteen twenty years, perhaps maybe. But we can't look we can't say that it's going to happen anytime soon, and. Uh, and anyone who tells you that otherwise, well, you know, it's just it just doesn't work like that. And the thing is, is that we need all political, the, the big major political parties to be on board of wanting to rejoin the EU, as well as an overwhelming majority wanting it too. Yes, there is the rejoin EU uh, campaign groups, which are doing a fantastic job in highlighting the prospects of or the reasons why we should rejoin the, the European Union. And long may they continue to to make that those points and and say to everyone that our foul Brexit is a disaster. But as of right now, it's not something we can do um, do um, even if uh, the public wanted it. Um, and uh, to say that Brussels doesn't want to to have that, I don't I don't I'd say they probably will do. But again, not right now. They have other things on their plate to deal with uh, Brussels before they even talk about the UK about anything like that. They don't want to go through what they went through before, especially with the conservatives of what uh, the conservatives in, who were in charge. So yeah, Brussels don't want to talk about it right now. But again, maybe in 15, 20 years time, they'll have that discussion. But I wouldn't dismiss it saying that it will. it is going to be never say never is what I will say on this. So Peter Malsman has dismissed the prospect of an incoming Labour government, taking Britain back into the EU, saying you've got to be joking that Brussels will want to renegotiate the UK membership. The Labour peer, the former EU Trade Commissioner and close advisor to Keir Starmer, said rejoining the, the 27 country bloc will require a referendum that UK voters had little desire for, for after the Conservatives botched the handling of Brexit. There is no proper way to handle Brexit. There is no way you could have done this. Um... Unless the only way you could have made this work is if we hadn't left the single market and customs union and it would have been very minimal impact then. But I also have to consistently remind people because people forget this point 
is that people did not, when they voted to leave the European Union on that ballot box, people did not vote to leave the single market and customs union. People were not told that. People were told that that would not be happening. So as far as I'm concerned, people were lied to in that, in that amongst many other things. So it's important to remember that as well. Um, Brussels, I do think Brussels will want to renegotiate the mem uh, to will want to renegotiate the trade uh, deal at some point. Uh, I, I know it's coming up for review in a few years' time, but I don't think it's, I don't know if that's going to be a point where the EU and Britain will look at it. Uh, will will re revamp everything. They may may make minimal changes, but I don't see any big big changes being made. But uh, I, I can see that um, it things that may they might tweak things that over time that will be beneficial to both the EU and Britain because that's how they how things work they want it to be beneficial for both countries and businesses I cannot see the British people running towards a referendum for love nor money or after what they went through during the last one I do not think that people are going to run towards the repeat of that experience he told the British Chambers of Commerce event at Heathrow Airport on Wednesday I don't yeah I agree on on that point as of right now nobody will want Nobody wants that, um, but people will still mention it. Law Manson, speaking at the launch of the lobby group report on building global Britain after the general election, added that Starmer's government would build closer ties with the EU without joining. The EU wanted a more stable, constructive relationship with the UK, Manson continued, but there was no desire in Brussels for wholesale negotiations of the country's return. Yeah, I, I agree with that uh, position. Reopen the negotiation, you've got to be joking, he said. They have got other priorities. They've got other fish to fry now, and they're not going to go through back and forth, up and down, a seesaw motion, another protracted, probably hard fought over an indecisive negotiation with Britain. So that's uh, simply answered. These comments come after the BCC called for politicians to step out of the Brexit uh, long shadow and prioritise trade, including closer ties with the UK's single largest trading partner. Martha Lane Pox, the tech entrepreneur and president of the BC, said there was often a reluctance among politicians to either negotiate problems or suggest solutions because of how they may be viewed in the either side of the Brexit divide. Uh, this must stop. Our politicians must be bolder in their decision making. They must set out a strategy on how we manage EU regulation and where it makes sense to diverge so that British businesses can benefit, she said. Madison said Brexit had triggered a roller coaster ride of instability, a merry-go-round of changing ministers, and that left the British economy travelling uh, along with one arm behind our backs. Speaking to business leaders in the headquarters of the company responsible for operating Heathrow, overlooking the airport's northern runway, the former business secretary under Tony Blair said Labour would not follow the Conservative post-Brexit strategy of chasing free trade deals around the world. And no, they shouldn't. And some of the trade deals have been diabolical, i.e., you know, what's happened with our British farmers, of course, with the Australian New Zealand trade deal, just among many other issues. However, he said there was a danger that Britain could become stranded between a possible Donald Trump administration in the US and a weaker post Brexit relationship with Brussels. There is a danger that we have become stranded and what and um, or that we become collateral damage in what could be quite become quite an escalated tension, he said. Trump, who launched a series of increasing bitter trade battles with the US traditional allies and adversaries alike during his time in the White House, has said that if he's elected in November, then he will propose a 10% tariff on all goods imported into the US. Danielson said the measure could push the UK to join with others to maximise the influence that we exercise, including the EU and other G7 nations, while also suggesting that action was required to strengthen the World Trade Organization. What a calamity a trade war would be for both for the US and Europe, and I have to say for the rest of the world, he said. Yeah, that would be really, really bad, without a shadow of a doubt, if if, he, if uh, Trump was elected and imposed that uh, that 10% um, on, on the rest of the world. Um, but that's neither here nor there. We're not really going to. I'm not really going to discuss too much on 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 that. But what I will say, obviously, finishing up on on this, is that yes, of course. Um, you know we can't. He's made he makes valid points there, um, and I think anybody who's talking about rejoining uh, rejoining right now is just uh, you know he's talking in cuckoo clan, uh, cuckoo land right now. In all seriousness, guys, I know it's frustrating, but doesn't mean to say that in 10, 15, 20 years time that we can't start having these negotiations and having these serious conversations with with the EU again. But we've got to sort out our own political health, and there needs to be a desire amongst politicians, and there needs to be a desire amongst voters to want to rejoin and that's down to grassroots campaigns as well as influencing MPs in those positions if we want to do that uh, because until we do 
they're not really going to have any chance of joining the European Union again. Um, and I think that's a really important point to make, guys. So moving away from Brexit, uh, sticking with uh, stuff relating to the House of, uh, sticking with things related to the House of Lords. I teased this story a bit yesterday on the Snowflake Watch live stream. This headline here from Sky News is that peers approve a hundred pounds allowance for their overnight stay. Previously, those heading to the House of Lords who needed accommodation paid for it from their daily allowance of three hundred forty-two pounds. But the new rules will come into force after Easter. So, what's this mean? So this basically means they're going to be getting even more money, um, peers from the Houses of Lords, and it's really, really quite uh, frustrating when we already have. Um, considering how much taxpayer money we waste on the monarchy, how much taxpayer money is spent on MPs getting a freaking pay rise, and then you hear peers are approving an extra £100 allowance for their overnight stays. This is on top of what they're already getting. It's just like, there is just like, while we still have kids up and down the country, in particular here in England, who cannot feed themselves. You know, people who can't afford to pay their bills, while these guys continue to and basks themselves with more pay for themselves here, the peers, and the MPs are still getting themselves a nice hefty salary at the cost of the taxpayers. You know, it really does paint that picture of run rule for them and run rule for the rest of us here. Um, I just, you feel that disconnect. And to add on top of in, uh, insult to injury when it comes to the House of Lords, this is something that we have no say in. We don't elect them. We don't have any any decision making whatsoever in this. And it's a system that needs to be knocked down or reformed significantly for the benefit of the British public. And I think that's something I'm sure most people will agree with me. So members of the House of Lords have approved changes to their allowance system that will grant them up to £100 per night to cover overnight stays in London for parliamentary business. Peers have already received a daily allowance of £342 to cover the expenses including travel and uh, uh, when heading to Westminster. And rules changes in 2010 following the parliamentary expenses scandal stated they were expected to use this cash to pay for any accommodation. But the new system means that they can claim up to another additional £100 towards the cost of hotels, clubs and smaller accommodations. Though memberships are warned, Parliament's authorities would come down very, very hard on those who abuse the system. I still like is this really necessary is the question do they need this additional hundred pounds is the question I need to ask do so do some of you guys generally think that that is fair I don't think it is I really really don't I don't think it's necessary if I'm honest peers who live in London will not be entitled to the additional allowance and receipts uh, will have to be requ will have to be required to claim the money the new system will come into force after the Easter research when members return to continue their scrutiny on the government's Rwanda plan. However, the allowance is less than half of that given to MPs, who can claim costs up to £210 a night when they come to London from work. £210 a night? They don't need that much money. A night. A night! Do they need that much money? Leader of the House of Lords, Lords True, said Parliament's upper chamber must be accessible to all regardless of financial status and location. But is this necessary? Is this money necessary is the question. He added, we have become far too much of a house of the south east of England and it's not right that some may be deterred from coming to this house because attendance would impose a significant financial burden on them. I do believe that the proposed strikes, uh, the proposal strike a balance. We must be mindful that money that we spend in this place is not our own. And I agree with that segment, but is, is the money not enough is the question. Scottish Labour peer Lord McCall said the changes were long overdue, while Liberal Democrat peer Noel Booby said it would relieve real problems for a significant number of members who have been coming and in some cases been out of pocket. House of Lords authorities were able to say how much the new allowance was expected to cost the taxpayer. Oh, I, I still question this. Like They say this is, this is necessary. I still question it, guys. Um, I, I just think... You know, the, the system doesn't work anyway, the House of Lords system. But um, £342. I, I, I think um, 
it, it varies on, on, on it very it does vary on person to person i think it will say but I, i'm i'm i may some people may vehemently disagree but i think i think it's um i don't think it's uh uh it's necessary if i'm honest i think there are ways around this and i think uh, if you're going to be an mp you need to be prepared to put your hand in your pocket sometimes as well um uh and th these i just feel like these guys these people get a lot of money and i think maybe if you if you want to do have a serious conversation about these allowances and whatnot if we want to have a serious conversation okay let's let's let's, let's say hypothetically that they are some of these mps are struggling financially okay let's say some of them are when it comes uh, some of the peers or mps when it comes to coming in then perhaps maybe their travel expenses should cost should vary depending on their location from where their constituency is to Westminster. So it could be a bit more and it could be a bit less. Uh, their travel expenditure could be worth a bit more or a bit less depending on where they are. So say for instance, obviously if you're up in Scotland, obviously your travel expenses should be more. If you're literally from outside London, it should be little to none. Uh, or if it's in London, it should be little to none, something like that. That way it comes across a bit more, seems more fairer to me, as opposed to everyone gets the same allowance. It should be, maybe it should be more based on geography-wise, where you are constituency-wise, where your constituency should be based. Because obviously you're expected to be living in your constituency, serving the people there. So you, understandably, then it should be based on that and geography-wise from there to to there. And that maybe should be based on your expenditures there if you wanted to talk about it being more fairer rather than everyone having the same sum. I don't know. Maybe that's an idea that might work. It might not. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section down below. If you haven't already, please hit the like button and share it across social media so others are notified of this video, guys. Because and subscribe because it really does help support the channel. This next one we've got for you guys is from the BBC. Um, once again, um, we have more environmental problems. We've already talked about this before, but just to highlight these uh, story again, guys. So raw sewage spills into England and rivers and seas have doubled in 2023, guys. So the sewage spills into England, rivers and seas by water companies by more than doubled last year. So more than doubled, guys. I've said that um, any, for me personally, any water that's, any sewage that's being dumped, I think is wrong and is an abominable, abomination. I really, really do. Um, I don't think there should be in any way, shape or form any reason whatsoever for any sewage to be dumped i think it should all be treated every single liter of it 100 percent of it should be all treated poor but before being let back into rivers and seas and i don't i you know for me that should be this should be the main standard um we've got to get these water companies uh under control um as so there's been a report so i've seen a report somewhere that thames water could be uh, or one one water company, I think it's Thames Water. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, it's really struggling financially apparently, um, which is kind of a stunner, quite a shocker considering they've made so much. Which is quite shocking considering that they've racked up these debts and yet shareholders are still racking in millions of pounds at the expense of these water bills that we're paying for, and we're going to be paying even more uh, to fix some of the 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 wall the wall the the system some of our systems they are asking us to pay more as well because they failed to um, look after our water systems it's ridiculous they have literally ra raked in so much money these water companies and paid them off to our shareholders and dividends and that money has barely gone into infrastructure whatsoever in this country and this this is this is privatization because their number one uh, priority is profits doesn't matter about you your your water system no, they don't care about your water system they will do the absolute they will get their staff or workers to do the absolute bare minimum when it comes to it because they don't want to be paying uh, anything towards the work that uh, paying to little to nothing to the work that they need to do they want you to be paying top top the top dollar or pound as we say here out of your pocket yeah for for your water bill and they will do the most minimalist of work to make it look like they're actually doing something. <sighs> if it's already doubled in 2023, I hate to think what num what it's going to be in 2024. But considering that since we left the EU, there's not enough regulation, they're kind of just able, and the government just 
not doing anything about it as always it's really really infuriating i know lib dems have been shouting about about this as well uh quite a bit so I've, let's hope that labor if they do come into power intend to to, to do something about this as soon as possible so sewage spills into England, rivers and seas by water companies more than doubled last year, according to the Environmental Agency, where there were 3.6 million hours of spills compared to 1.75 million hours in 2022. UK Water, the industry body for sewage companies, said it was unacceptable, but the record levels were due to heavy rain. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not accepting. I'm not expecting the we accepting the weather as uh, as. Uh, as to blame for this the war companies have a responsibility they know what they are they are and they're choosing not to use the sewage companies uh the the industry uh, they, they, i think it's more of a choice than anything else and they're choosing to take it a cheap way out sewage billing can be legal but environmentalists say it should only happen in exceptional weather this for me i would ban i would ban sewage billing i would ban it i really would and i would say no you have to you have to process all of it and if there's not enough in the sewage companies where you are then you need to take it somewhere else where it does get processed but you're not putting it in our waters and i i, I would outright ban uh ban it in only in extreme circumstances extreme circumstances and the Environment Agency said it's important to note that heavy rainfall does not affect water companies' responsibility to manage storm overflows in line with legal requirements. The UK has combined sewage systems, which mean rain and sewage share the same 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 pipes. That should change. Um, that I think they should they should look at that. If there is too much rain, sewage treatment works can be overwhelmed. Sewage is spilled into waterways to prevent the system backing up. Hmm. It works out on average last year that there were 1,271 spills a day across England compared to 825 in 2022. Contained within the spills is human waste, wet wipes and sanitary products which can pose serious risk to local wildlife swimmers and others who use uh, UK waterways. The rain can help dilute the sewage. Okay, that's probably the reason why. But academics warn there is still a risk to the local environment and anyone swimming in the bodies of water. Sewage pollution in the UK severely impacts waterways, with not a single river in England rated as healthy, according to the latest River Trust Rivers report, said Dr Diane Albee, research fellow at the Bioscience at University of Exeter. She explained that sewage in rivers can reduce oxygen levels in the water, which can harm harms aquatic life and cause sickness in humans due to the presence of harmful microorganisms and parasites. So it was sewage discharge near, near use. Uh, st storm overflows in England 2023 scale by total hours of discharge. Interact with the map to find out more here. This is a source from the Environmental Agency. So interesting here. So we could look at different different places here on the map. So uh, in 2023, this sewage storm overflow spilled 133 times for a total of 2,815 hours. Or about 170 days non-stop. That's right on the edge near Cornwall. Here on the Isle of Man. Spilled 30 times for a total of 325 hours. For a total of 14 days non-stop. 109 times in a total of 1,960. Or about 80 days non-stop. Uh, in London it seems to be very, very low here. But obviously uh, so the numbers are pretty... Uh, they Because of the Victorian water system. But you can see here around Bristol uh, area here, they're not very good here either. 74 times in a total of 1,003 hours or about 46 days non-stop there. Um, so uh, Birmingham uh, here and also here in here, I'm not sure where this is, but um, 1,903 hours, 120 times spilt or about 79 days non-stop. Uh, just above Birmingham there, some really... Uh, bad numbers here but if we just go right up here in the north where we've always uh, which was what does not should not surprise anyone we know it's obviously main issues here manchester liverpool the rural areas all suffering the most uh, spirit spillage is the most also around leeds in the midlands here up the north newcastle and pontine also suffering it as a result there on that side as well as on the other side um yeah, so the north is the north is mainly water system is not doing so well. So you can see here, obviously, on the map that not too much down mid Midlands 
is not as bad. There's obviously a bit further north, but and obviously down south on the Cornwalls and on the seas, seafront and southeast here is obviously really, really bad as well. So still, um, but I, I just think yeah, even even these ones here, uh, here and and down on the south south coast is still way, way, way too much. In March this year, when the River Thames was in floods, testing at Fulham Reach by the charity River Action revealed that there was up to 10 times the amount of E. coli bacteria that is allowed for bathing water status. Thames Water are nearing the end of a five billion eight long, uh, eight year long project to build a super sewer to tackle the issue of sewage spills into the River Thames. The Andy Mitchell, the CEO of Tideway, told BBC News, we're going to capture the vast, vast majority of sewage that comes into the river and it will mean a cleaner river. Last year, on behalf of all English sewage companies, UK Water announced that they would invest £10 billion to upgrade sewage infrastructure. But these plans first have to be approved by the regulator of what? I'm, I'm, I'm glad that Thames Water are doing this super sewage sewer thing. That's well, well and good. But what about up the north? What about up the north? That's that's the thing that kind of I'm looking at. I'm looking at right now. Like, like don't get me wrong. Like I'm happy that we're, they're going to be dealing with the tens. But what's the plan up here? What is the plan for these these overflows here? That's what I'm asking. So how long did sewage spills last in your area? This is date uh, for England 2023 here. So you can actually look at any water company here. And it can show actually each one there. So there's Thames Water, number of sewage spillage, 6,990. Average spills, uh, hour 12. Total duration of spills, 196,514. The religion of spills, data equivalent, 8,114. Uh, there. Oh, you can actually go through the whole list here, actually. So, um, so to make it easier. So angling water, number of sewage spillage, 31,363. Northumberland Water, 46,492. Uh, Severn and Trent Water, 6,253. Uh, South West Water, 58,249. Uh, sorry. Southern Water, 29,000 there. Uh, Thames Water, 16,990. Unite Utilities, 97,000 there. Uh, Wessex Water, 41,453 uh, uh, there. And Yorkshire Water, 77,761 there. So you can pause the, pause the video there if you want to have a look at these numbers. The link is in the description if you want to have a look at these. Um, but you can see them there, the numbers. The UK Wars has called on the government to accelerate this decision and other plans like banning wet wipes, which said that would eliminate thousands of spills which are happening as a result of blocked drains. The government's first promise to introduce this ban six years ago. I do think we need to do more to we need to um, ensure that more things are banned from being flushed down the toilet. I think I don't see why we can't do this. If you know the public can play its part by simply jump uh, with less things going in the in our sewage system. It's not that hard to do it. It really is just a case of, of ensuring that. It's just a case of putting it in the toilet, putting it in the bin instead. I don't see why we, why this is something. It's not the end of the world to do this. I really don't think it is. The War Minister, Robbie Moore, said, I have been clear that sewage pollution in our waters is unacceptable. Today's data show that water companies must go further and faster to tackle storm overflows and clean up our precious waterways. We will be ensuring the Environment Agency closely scrutinise these findings and take enforcement actions where necessary. In response to the data, Labour's Shadow Environment Secretary Steve Reid called on the government to introduce an immediate ban on bonuses for polluting uh, water bosses. Off what is currently undertaking a consultation to counter this measure. Liberal Democrat leader Ed Davis has called on the government to declare a national emergency that must include coverage on urgent stage meeting and look into the impact of sewage spills on people's health, he said. The Green Party co-leader, Carla Denner, said the £57 billion in payout from the water industry over the last 13 years should have gone towards improving standards. Yes, £57 billion in payouts, guys. Let's not forget that. The latest data revealed by the Environment Agency on Wednesday was taken from the monitoring stations installed as, uh, at combined sewers, overflows and CSOs. CSOs were developments that overflow valves to reduce the risk of sewage backing up in people's homes during heavy rainfall when sewage pipes became overloaded. The overall number of spills was expected to be higher because of the high rainfall in 2023, which was 20% uh, up above average 
and for the first time all 14,580 CEOs were fitted with monitors. In 2019 only 57% were fitted with, with monitors so only half of spills were recorded. Only half of them were recorded so some have been recorded and we don't know about potentially. And James Wallace, CEO of Charity River Action, told BBC News he is not surprised by the higher number of spills, but more because of a lack of oversight by the regulators. Water companies are not being made to invest in fixing their leaky pipes as long as we have an energy agency and off what that are incapable of doing their jobs and are not in the position to expect water companies to behave, he said. Off what and the Environment Agency are both conducting separate investigations into England's nine sewage companies with the outcome of these expected this year. But the two, these two agencies are themselves under investigation by the Independent Office of Environmental Protection, who are concerned they have intercepted the law incorrectly on sewage discharging, allowing spills whenever it rains, rather than when there is exceptional rainfall. Yeah, uh, that wouldn't surprise me as well. In the small Surrey town of Hawley, just outside Gatwick Airport, residents have seen local footpaths flooded ten times in the last year as the treatment works struggled to cope with heavy rainfall. Nigel Bond and Simon Collins from the local resident group uh, River Mole Watch said they have repeatedly contacted Thames Water and the Environment Agency about the issue, but they, but all they have uh, done is put sandbags down. He told BBC News, there's a problem with this sewage works in Hawley. When the storm tanks don't discharge into the river, they simply fill up and overtop. The sewage comes washing down the whole length of the footpath, where people are walking dogs and children are playing. Children are playing! Thames Water spokesperson said, We regret any untreated discharges that are unacceptable. We have published plans to upgrade over 250 of our sewage treatment works. This includes the Hawley Sewage Treatment Works. The upgrade is expected to begin construction in 2025. In the meantime, we have temporarily closed the footpath next to the site while we work with contractors to build new walls to help mitigate against flooding. In Wales, there were more than 980,000 hours of sewage bills by Welsh waters last year, according to separate figures released by the water company. Saying Williams, head of operations at Natural Resource Wales, the Welsh regulator said he continues to push the sector to reduce spill numbers. Interesting stuff here from the BBC on, on, this, on, on the um, situation, but just looking at this map still, like what are they doing about these ones up in the north? What 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 is the action plan here? What is the what is the action plan here? Is the question that I have, guys. I think that that's the question that I have, and it really does frustrate me that it's like we're having these issues, still having these issues, and what are we doing doing about it? What's being done about these things, guys? It is extremely frustrating, guys. It really, really is. So, guys, we're about. Just over 30 minutes in uh, to Regan's news round. We're going to take a little sh little break here from it. And we're going to be... Um, I have a very different funny video for you guys. And I re highly recommend checking it out. The link in the description for it. It's um, an interesting one to say the least. Definitely. The YouTube channel that this video is from is called Hitler Rants uh, Parodies. So, um, and this one here, he, uh, he phones uh, Rishi Sunak. Um, so I hope you guys um, enjoy this one. Oh, Gott, was ist los? Woher kommt die Schießerei? Mein Führer, darf ich Ihnen zum Geburtstag gratulieren? Wenn er sich ohne Befehl entfernt hat, ist er Fahnenflucht! Führer, wir haben noch keine Meldung. Ich spreche gerade mit Koller. Koller, geben Sie mir Koller. Koller. Hi. Sie wissen, dass Berlin auf der Artilleriefeier liegt. I'm, I'm, I'm prepared to lose. Hören Sie den Beschuss nicht? We've delivered record funding for the NHS and social care. Schools in England are surging up the global league tables. We're getting the economy growing. We've cut inflation in half. We've delivered the biggest business tax cut in modern British history. And in just the last few weeks, we've seen an incredible 60 billion pounds of investment into the UK. The Russians are an ice and over the all arm. For, oh yes, well, <laughs> you know, I, it's probably, I mean, I think bread, probably. Soll mit der zwölften Armee die Sache unterstützen? Kommende Generation dankbar sein. Well, I mean, the one that we buy, see, I think, I'm sure now it's about £1.20 and it was about £1 from, from memory, but it was before. Covid's it's a kind of seeded thing. Wenn er sich ohne Befehl entfernt hat, ist das Fahnenflucht. Jetzt suchen Sie ihn eben. Well, we have a whole boat range of different, oh, see, well, we all have different breads in my house. Das sind ja nur zwölf Kilometer bis zur Stadtkern. Is the Russian so nah? 
We inherited a bunch of formulas from the Labour Party that shoved all the funding into deprived urban areas. Uh, and they, you know, that needed to be undone. I started the work of undoing that. Happen, I want people to know that the government is on their side. People can judge me how I've acted over the past couple of years. I said on the steps of Drowning Street from the first time I addressed the country that mistakes were made. I'm the one that's taking responsibility for that and now going about fixing it. I know people always like to take the mick out of me for my uh, peloton that I, I use, but the, the reason I have to use this peloton is because I'm constantly eating either, you know, cookies or cake. We should look forward full of pride and optimism for what we can do together to build a brighter future for everyone. That's what I'm determined to do. With your own blood, she will suffer in your own blood. The British people won't trust a party that isn't serious with their money, and that's why they vote Conservative. I must see the ganze Luft da vom Führung sofort aufhängen. Uh, I, I, mean, I, I struggle to know whether to be uh, happy or, or, or not with that. Das heißt unerhört, unerhört. Der Russe steckt zwölf Kilometer vom Stadtkern und ich erfahre das sozusagen auf Nachfrage. Mein Führer, vielleicht handelt es sich ja wirklich um Fernfeuer. Sie erwinden eine Eisenbahnbrücke über die Oder. Ach, Unsinn! Oh, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, yeah, do check out the uh, do check out the channel Hitler Rants uh, parodies, guys. He's got lots of them, lots of them. Definitely uh, worth a laugh. He's done ones with Putin, with Trump, and a few others I've seen already, which is pretty hilarious. So do do check them out, guys. I hope, I hope you guys really enjoyed that because uh, that was definitely uh, definitely worth a laugh or two. So, guys, just before we go to the next article, guys, just want to remind you that, yes, Ollie is here. Yes, this is Ollie here. Ollie is not a very happy bunny. Do you know why he's not a happy bunny? Um, because, um, you know, what's the state of the, the United Kingdom is in right now. But you could make him smile again, guys. And you can help smile, make him smile by helping what I do here on this channel, by financially supporting me in the work I do here. You can do so by becoming a YouTube member for as little as 99p. That 99p can make a big difference when it comes to the work that I do here. So anybody willing to do so, I greatly appreciate. But if you want to go one step further, you can do also 299 membership where you can get early access to content before it becomes available for the rest of the public. However, if you're somebody who doesn't want to give uh, a cut of your money, hard-earned money, which you guys do, towards YouTube in financial support with me. There are other ways you can do so as well, by simply buying me a coffee, for example. I get a bigger cut, yeah, there, if you choose want to buy me a coffee for there, for the link is in the description. Or the other option you have is also to join me on Patreon. Joining me on Patreon gets access to extra content on there as well. So you'll still reap the benefits of content here on YouTube, whether you are a member or not. But if you financially support me on Patreon, which you can do, you also get access to extra content on there, as well as additional videos videos there as well so definitely worth checking out all those links in the description anybody who has whether it's super chaps or gifted memberships or is a member or is a patreon supporter or buy buy me a coffee thank you very much for all your support I greatly appreciate it so guys the next one we have here is from the independent the Tories have just 1% chance of winning the next election, says the polling guru John Curtis. The top pollster warning comes amid the dire opinion poll ratings and the looming local elections. Just 1%, guys. Now, when John Curtis, who is the guru when it comes to polling, when he says this, everyone, excuse me, needs to stand up and pay attention. You really should stand up and pay attention. The fact that the Tories have just 1% still means that they have a chance. It is a small chance but they do have a chance and the British public are generally fed up of the Conservatives they don't want to vote Conservatives 
There are many who are subscribers of my channel who believe in reform. They believe what Richard Tice and Nigel Farage and the likes of reform have promised them, although I vehemently don't think they are in their best interest or in the best interest of the country, but we agree to disagree on that. I don't believe everything that everyone should vote for Labour. When people say that you, if you don't vote Labour, um, you're a Tory enabler, I don't. I reject that premise entirely. And the reason I inject, I reject that premise entirely is that there are many, many people up and down this country and even ordinary people on the streets who have been who've had a put a camera in front of them or a microphone in front of them, whether it's from Politics Joe, Times Radio, or LBC, whoever, and have asked people out in the general public. They are angry. They are fed up of the Conservatives. They are fed up of 14 years and they want something different. And if that means them voting Labour, they're going to vote for Labour. So this idea or premise that that you are allowing the Conservatives back in, I just I don't accept that premise as of right now. Now my position could change closer to the general election, but I don't accept that premise in any way, shape, or form. Obviously, I say this um, as someone from England. <clears throat> for those in Scotland, I will say your best your best bet if you want to push for a referendum on Scot Scottish independence once again is to vote for SNP. I could also understand some Scots may want to vote for the Scottish Labour, potentially, for some reason, as they, to try and oust the Conservatives, although I don't personally think that it's a wasted vote, but it's up to you where you want to cast your vote up there. For those in Wales, I obviously would say um, in your best interest is to vote for Labour there in Wales, but well, that's the best I can give for them. I uh, can't comment on Northern Ireland. Again, I don't know enough about Northern Ireland, but here in England, I'm, I'm personally voting for Green. Um, is where I'm in a Labour strong constituency, so my vote is not going to make any massive a difference in our first past the post system. However, if you want to tactically vote out the Conservatives, I say go right ahead if that's what you think is in the best interest of you and the best interest of this country, and that's totally fine if you want to do that. However, if you're not sure where you want to cast your vote, I would say um, you vote what you think is in the best interest of you and your friends and family. That's my best response to that. Uh, in regards to it. So <clears throat> we, we expect the Conservatives to be wiped out. What well, question is, is what happens after it? So Rishi Sunak has suffered another blow after the country's top polling guru had put the Conservatives' chances of winning the next election at just 1%. Sir John Curtis said the Tories had little hope of being able to turn around the dire poll results. He also warned Labour would be in such a much stronger position if it came to it, near to negotiate a minority government, saying that apart from the possibility the DUP and the Conservatives have no friends in the House of Commons. The leaky, leading, um, I cannot say that word, guys. Warning to political uh, will pile more pressure on the bereaved Conservatives following the resignation of two cabinet ministers who have stepped down at the next election. Yes, another two people have stepping down. It's they are, as everyone keeps liking to put it, <coughs> everyone literally in the Titanic. Before he hits the iceberg, but Sunak can't see in no iceberg. It's all roses to him. Robert Halfen unexpectedly quit as a skills apprenticeship and higher education minister, while James Hippy followed through on his stated intention to step down as armed forces minister ahead of the exit in parliament at the general election. His departure means 63 Conservative MPs have publicly said they are either standing down from Parliament or not considering their current seat at the next general election. The resignations follow a series of appalling opinion poll ratings for the Conservatives, most recently culminating in the Telegraph's Savannah poll tracker, which put the Conservatives at their lowest rating since the aftermath of List Trust's disastrous mini-budget, which forced um, her from her office on 24%, not even outlasting the letters. Labour are consistently holding a 20-point lead, adding to speculation that the party will storm for victory and form the next government. As the House of Commons goes into recess, Rishi Sunak is gearing up for his biggest challenge yet, as the local ele ele council elections loom on the 2nd of May. I've got my card. Have you got yours, Londoners? Let me know in the comment section down below. His party are set to face mass losses at the country's as the country kicks back against a depleted local council funding, the cost of living and the discontent with the ruling party. Mr Sunak launched his local election campaign earlier this week, attacking Labour leader Keir Starmer for arrogantly taking votes for granted and assuming he can just stroll into number 10. This is the one and only thing that I agree with Mr Sunak on. He, he does assume he can stroll into number 10. But the thing is, is that you don't, you keep saying they have, you keep saying you have a plan, Mr Prime Minister, but we don't know what that plan is. 
But a recent poll by Colin Radley's and Michael Frasher have said Conservative losses are inedible. And if the party repeat the poor performances of 2023, when the MEV, that's the National Equivalent Vote Share, put them below 30%, they stand to lose up to 500 seats. Half their councillors are facing uh, election. The MVP adjust the votes cast in particular set of elections and take account of patterns and contents in that year, providing a snapshot of countrywide voting preferences. It is used by some pollsters to gauge national and political opinion between general elections. Mr Sunak has argued amongst his colleagues in the face of poor surveys and Tory infighting that some backbench MPs have privately warned that a dire performance of uh, during the local councils could face another leadership election or push the Prime Minister towards an early general election. Now we were expecting at the time of this, well, obviously time of this recording, I was expecting a May general election, but that's not happened. Um, but it looks like potentially it's going to be around um, October. Potentially the teasers have been from uh, potentially what it could be. It could even be as late as January 2025. Um, not happy that we are still uh, the clock is kind of ticking and we're still waiting for that general election. We wanted it called in, in May and it wasn't called in May. Um, we just feel like the longer this drags on, the, the, the more the country gets dragged under the mud every passing day that they're in power. And we, we do want our voice back. We want our say on, on, on uh, the incumbent government. And uh, and they, they are going to get an absolute kicking. They are going to get an absolute, absolute kicking at the um, at this general election, guys. Isn't that right, Ollie? Isn't that right? Uh, Ollie is in 100% agreement with me here. Um, he, struck, he expects he expects them to get a right kicking, uh, right kicking. Uh, that's for sure at the local elections, the mayoral elections, and the, the general election, guys. <sighs> so two more articles to go, guys. Just so you guys are aware, you can also find me in other social media links as well, such as TikTok and Instagram, where I post my YouTube shorts on them on those platforms as well. The link for them is in the description. And you can also find me on Twitch TV at Regan Elite One as well, where I do live stream my live streams both on here on YouTube and on Twitch. So if you have any of them, feel free to follow me on those platforms as well. Links for them. And also, as well, I also cover uh, stories from outside the UK on Rumble every Monday to Friday as well. So if you have a Rumble account, feel free to follow me on there as well. And you can find additional content on there as well. So feel free to check out all the links in the description, guys. Be greatly appreciated. So this next one, guys, is um, a sensitive one to talk about. Um, I have talked about um, these stories in different ways. And this one is from Open Democracy. Um, there we go. A dying baby, a Trump tweet inside the network setting global right wing agenda. So leaked emails from Agenda Europe and network reveals how its members collaborate daily to roll back abortion and LGBTQ plus rights here. So it's not just about obviously here in the UK, but also around the world about how they are looking. This uh, network of groups are looking to try and um, ban abortions and to make it harder for LGBTQ rights to be kept. Uh, making it more difficult now someone um, I want to address as well, as well a comment that was made to me with regards to the video I made about Liz Trust and her video uh, and the video about her her bill which wasn't heard whether you agree to disagree now I, I, I said in the video and I'll say this here I vehemently disagree with Liz Trust's bill and the uh, and the fact that um, LGG L GBTQ um, and uh, whether about their spaces. Now I said on the premise. Now I said this then, and I said this there. I said that if 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 women and LGBTQ plus want separate spaces, then that is something that needs to be discussed. Um, however, um, there is there is a dis it is a sensitive area to talk about. But I was basically accused of being against transgender rights because I basically said they should be separate. Because I said I said there should be separate. I said that's not what I said. I didn't say that. What I said was, is that if they want it, if both women want it and and LGBT transgender women want it, then it should be open to discussion. That's what I said. So to say that I'm against uh, uh, transgender is is uh, completely nonsense. And uh, I've covered 
then that, that's not the only video I've covered on uh, transgender issues. I've covered it with regard in schools as well, and it was a very difficult. And it's there. There is no right way of talking of uh, talking about this sensitive subject because I don't want to take away the rights of anyone in in the discussion on that whatsoever. And the same is here. You know, people's uh, women's women should be allowed to decide what they want to do with their bodies, what they want to do with with their babies. It's their body, their choice. Which is why it infuriates me that there's some kind of justification to say that that you are that you're some kind of murderer or you you incur the wrath of God if you if you cast this abortion and and say no to a baby and it's just like the child is not even born yet it's 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 not even a, an actual baby it's like and there are hundreds and hundreds of reasons why abortions matter abortions matter I mean it's so important for women it really really is I can't stress this enough like. It's just just taking away that that option for women to choose whether they want to have that baby or not. Um, who are who who are you to say whether women should have that choice or not? You really shouldn't. Um, it should be their choice. Um, whether you agree or disagree with their position. So yeah, let's read into what these lot are planning. So Charlie Gard was two was just two months old when he was admitted to London's Great Ormond Street Hospital with breathing difficulties in October 2016. He remained there for up to days before his death in July 2016, when the High Court ruled against the wishes of his parents that his life support ma machine should be switched off as the brain damage caused by his rare genetic disorder was too severe for any hope of successful treatment. Guard's case captured the attention of Agenda Europe, a network of more than 400 ultra-conservatives who have spent the previous four years working together to oppose abortion, equal marriage, divorce and contraception, and had links to the Kremlin, Donald Trump and far-right MPs across Europe. One member of the Agenda Europe emailed others to encourage them to target the British authorities and the hospitals a month before donors switched off Guard's life support. Three weeks after the call for action, the Metropolitan Police was forced to launch an investigation into a torrent of death threats and abuse targeted at the hospital staff, included on social media. That's it's, this is them trying to take advantage of. This is them. They see this as an advantage to try and take of here. Like I know it's just, it's, you know the the right to die and assistant dying is a it's another one that's another sensitive topic, but these guys here are not looking for the benefit they're looking to take advantage of people in this situation because when you're in these situations when you're in these kind of things yeah you, you're vulnerable your mind is vulnerable and that's how i see what these people are doing another member gregor public of the european center for law and justice responded to an email by tony brandy of italian anti-abortion organization to pro vita to reassure members that his organization had sent the case right to the top of the United States government. The Centre Chief Counsel Jay Soruk had intervened with Trump on Guard's case, public email said. That same day in July 2017, the then US President went on to tweet that he wanted to help uh, the British infant. An unusual step for the head of the state in another country, Trump's office did not respond to open democracy requests for comment. You see what's going on here. These leaked emails are just two uh, of thousands of exchange between agend agendas group of Europe members, which have been seen by Open Democracy and a small group of European journalists. They reveal for the first time how US, Russian and European anti-abortion, anti-LGBTQ plus activists and politicians were in cons constrained contract, offering support on local and national campaigns. The group's actions include campaigning on referendums that successfully prevent equal marriage rights, challenging calls to end gender-based violence and influencing the rise of anti-abortion, anti-LGBTQ plus feelings and policy making in multiple European countries. As the following shows, these emails illustrate the emergence of a coherent and organised counter-narrative to the liberal worldview that was, until recently, generally espoused with an increasing number of democracies around the world. Agenda Europe is, and its successor, Vision Network, serves as a gathering place where conservatives fought, uh, fought in its many disparity strands come together, came together in a cohesive world view. 
Austrian MP Gollan Kogar, one of several elected politicians active in the network, told Open Democracy, it is democratically legitimate to be pro-life. Even if you personally disagree, it is democratically legitimate to connect with others who call themselves pro-life. Less than a year after Guard's death, members had honed onto the tragic case of another serious British ill toddler, Alfie Evans, whose parents were in legal battles to continue his treatment against the advice of doctors. Staff members at Spanish anti-gender advocacy uh, groups Citizens Go weighed in. Esther Zamasuski, the group's campaign director in Hungary, urged members to sign its petition to support the Evans family, while its founder, uh, Igoros Ascua, said that the British state saw Evans as their property. Citizens Go did not respond in our request for comment. Other Agenda Europe emails asked members to look into the potential backgrounds of the judges who would be ruling on Evans' case. Alexander Stefkowski of Poland's Catholic legal organisation Aldo Lewis responded by claiming without any evidence that one army, Anthony Henry, was an LGBT activist. Members often use racist and homophobic language when discussing UK issues. Other emails fear it derides how women who had abortions should be punished or praised for pro-Russian President Vladimir Putin, laws that de facto decriminalise domestic abuse in Russia. Catholic influencer Emeril Ammons wrote uh, to the group that warned that the UK had become uh, Yobaria following news that a Christian NHS worker lost her appeal after being found guilty by her employer of harassing and bullying a Muslim colleague. Who's funding these organisations? Who's funding these organisations? Yeah? Who do we think is funding these organisations, guys? We know that these organisations are being funded by powerful, dangerous people who want to disrupt life. It's not right. Adamus told Open Democracy that he was aware of Agenda Europe's uh, activities but not involved in any official capacity. He said he does not recall the email mentioned or the exchange. Lucia Vontu, a Citizens Go board member and founder of the Italian anti-abortion organisation Neuroterrorist Foundation, replied on the same for Fred, saying that the oh, sorry if I can't pronounce this, guys, algorithm. Uh, Sikh spirit will infect all of Europe and is infecting UK court decisions. What a load of bloody nonsense, guys. And people people fall into this trap. Others members label LGBTQ plus people as Sondermites who were pursuing a lifestyle choice and claim gender studies is culturally Marxist propaganda designed to subvert culture. Cultural Marxism is, is a term closely associated with far-right anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. Again, nonsense, people. One of the coordinators of the network was ADF International. The Europe's arm of the US Space Alliance Defensive Freedom designated as, as a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Centre for their relentless campaigning against LGBTQ plus rights. When ADF International Lawrence uh, Wilkinson emailed the group asking for observations about the UK lawyers standing to become judges on the European Court of Human Rights, one member accused one candidate of being part of the homo lobby, a term frequently deployed. This is them trying to under undermine things, undermine people and, and everything. The network offers a space for activ activists, lawyers and academics to collaborate with politicians in order to achieve their anti-gender aims. This includes offering advice to political figures from Eastern Europe on how to prevent the ratification of Istanbul Convention to tackle men's violence against women. Members celebrate when Latvia and Bulgaria did not ratify the convention. Irish clack. Catholic activists, meanwhile, sought advice on how to shape Ireland's abortion law after it was decriminalised in 2018. The same year, Citizens Go Asuka asked for information on Poland's abortion laws, which are among the strictest in Europe, as there are political parties that want to study these Polish laws to use them as an approach to abortion zero in Spain. Citizens Go, which, country, which counted many of its staff among Agenda Europe members, worked closely with Spain's far-right Vox party, which wants to ban abortions. Emails criticised Open Democracy previously reported on the network members, including the close relationship between Spain, Citizen Go and Vox. In the UK, the Senior Executive Officer for the Rights of Right to Life UK, um, 
Alistair Hungerford Morgan shared job adverts for a pro-life research unit uh, based in Westminster and in 2019 alerted the network for a strong push for the UK government to introduce abortion law in Northern Ireland. Was dr drastically changed abortion legislation in England and Wales. Abortion was decriminalised in Northern Ireland that year. In 2017, Agenda Europe Summit, at which Hungerford Morgan was listed speaking, featured a section on how to build such units in Parliament. Australian Austrian MP sorry, Grogan Curler emailed fellow Agenda Europe members asking for your expertise on what does a parliament need to legislate in order to remove radical gender ideology after she was elected to the Australian, Austrian parliament in 2017. The European Christian political movement Leo van Dolsberg and Citizens Go were among those that responded to her request. Louise McCudden, the UK Head of External Affairs at the pro-choice charity MSI Reproductive Choices said Open Democracy finally reveal how shadowy groups work together to lobby for anti-abortion agendas that does not have majority public support. These groups use money and tactics from overseas taking advantage of the drastically turbulent political climate to push for policies which drastically roll back gender equality and for which they know they would uh, never get a democratic support in an open debate, McCudden explained. The leaked emails also reveal how Agenda in Europe may pursue other strategies which were less focused on specific campaigns to frame the debate around LGBTQ plus rights. Marina Organi from the Centre for Family and Human Rights, CFAM, urged the network to uh, mock LGBTQ plus activists. Austin Rose, her, bo uh, her boss at CFAM, a Catholic charity, has been designed by designed a hate group by the Southern Law Poverty Center, responded agreeing, we need more mockery. These kind of organizations need to be um, need to be called out for who they are. And anyone associated with them need to be called out as well. After learning about this investigation, CFAM published false claims about open democracy on its website including that Open Democracy had hacked Agenda Europe's emails. Ruth responded to our request for comment by writing. Don't need to tell you. Ruth was just one of Agenda Europe's prominent US members. Others including Brian Brown from the World's Congress of Families, the WCF. Sharon Slater, a Mormon activist best known for her work campaigning against LGBTQ plus rights in Africa. A disgraced Trump lawyer, John Eastman, the free exchange emails with Roos discussing how to use Trump's win to clamp down on abortion and LGBTQ uh, plus rights in Europe and Africa. Slater's, which uh, the founder of Family Watch International, was a vocal member of the group. The leaked email showed how she, she regularly asked the network to share her content, offered advice on PR and solicited advice on how to best push against gender rights. <clears throat> The network also has multiple Russian links, with Ruse thanking the Russian Federation for hosting a joyful reception for half a dozen Agenda European members in 2016. Brown's WCF co-founder, a Russian organisation called FamilyPolicy.ru, which was run by Alexei Komu and Pavel Malofesky, both employed by sanctioned Russian oligarch Kolyskin Malofesky. Both Komovich and Pakovich were members of Agenda Europe, and worked with Citizens Go and WCF. Agenda Europe members would often praise Russia for its anti-gender policies and spread disinformation about its actions in Ukraine. <coughs> Excuse me, my voice is starting to crack up. Citizens Go then CEO Alvala Sugla celebrated Putin in a 2016 email that proclaimed Vala Russia. His colleagues Pratikas sent a 2016 email to Agenda Europe to dismiss claims of an existing Russian invasion in Ukraine as countless myths. The email was sent two years after Russia's occupation of Crimea. Kuskus, the Australian uh, Austrian MP, told the Democracy that there has never been, uh, never been before, uh, the illegal invasion and not afterwards. A Russia endorsing tendency in this platform. Agenda Europe closed in 2019 only to rebrand as the Vision Network according to a 2019 email sent by ADF International Sariska Kersby. Its influence is still being felt in the UK via its Illuminati links to anti-abortion, anti-LGBTQ plus MPs. UK Conservative MPs Marianne Cates, uh, for example, spoke uh, at, spoke at um, a 2023 event alongside WCF Brown. 
Sorry, I'm just checking something, guys. Apologies. And other leading European Europe members, both she and her Conservative Party colleagues, Danny Kruger, also sat on the advisory board of the Anti-Rights ARC Forum Advisory Board alongside Kruger. Open Democracy also revealed how Irish MEPs Marilyn McGuinness planned to increase religious lobbies in the European Parliament. Other investigations met with anger in the Google Group. McGuinness' former advisor was a vocal presence in Agenda Europe. And Gender Europe was an informal network of individuals and organisations working on fundamental freedoms and basic human rights to exchange ideas, Kirby told Open Democracy. Members did not agree on everything she added, describing the email context as a free exchange of ideas. My God, this um, group is um, extremely dangerous. Abortions, anti-LBGQ, taking advantage of people with assisting dying, the influence that this organisation has and its ties with, with so many people is, is just absolutely insane, guys. It's absolutely crazy. Um, sorry, guys, I keep... There was a doorbell and I was just checking, just checking if there was anybody actually there. Um, <clears throat> this um, is extremely dangerous uh, group, that is for sure, this Agenda Europe network. To, and um, it's going to it's not going to be the last time we hear of similar organizations and groups out there looking to take advantage of take advantage of people and um, dipping their hands into influence and politicians and whatnot this needs to be groups like these need to be called out and why is it only open democracy that have called this as well where is the rest of the mainstream media on this surely something like this is a significant threat to democracy is it not Surely something like this should be something that everyone should be shouting about. Screaming at the top of their lungs saying, hey, this group is trying, uh, and anyone associated with this group should be called out without a shadow of a doubt. But doesn't appear to be. It appears to be quite little to no silence. I'm not sure if any of you guys are aware of this group and their findings, but if you are, please let me know in the comments below. Um, but you know, trying to undermine and subvert, uh, subvert people's rights here. Um, it's an extremely, extremely dangerous organisation, guys. And, um, yeah, Ollie's, um, Ollie's really concerned about the well-being of, of people with women's rights and uh, LGBTQ+, plus and, and their rights as well, aren't you, Ollie? Yeah. We have one more story for you guys. Just want to say, if you've been watching all the way, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. Excuse me. This last one, guys, is from Barline Times. And the headline is Public Satisfaction with the NHS and Social Care Fall to Record Lows. NHS doctor David Oliver explains why the results of the damning new stud survey should alarm patients and healthcare professionals. The satisfaction with the healthcare system, without a shadow of a doubt, has gone down. We know this. Um, um, I'm going to speak just in particular England. I'm not going to speak, I won't speak for Scotland. They may cover a bit of Wales or Scotland in the article, but I'm just going to speak for England specifically, guys. Now, there's no question that satisfaction has dropped with the National Healthcare Service, uh, but there is still public support for our National Healthcare Service, despite what the Conservatives are trying very, very hard to do, and that is to take it, take it away from us and private, uh, privatise it if they've not privatised everything already. Um, and without a shadow of a doubt, we know that West Street is planning to invert more privatisation into the NHS. He made those stupid comment about investing more in the private privatisation in order to reduce the amount of privatisation in the NHS. You, you answer that question to me, I don't know. But um, there are no signs that Private, private involvement in the NHS is not going to go away. And this consistent push by the private sector to continue to push people off the NHS and onto private health care, paying you out of your own pocket for treatment. That is what generally has been happening. Uh, that is what the government have kind of been sitting on. They're pushing people, pushing people off the NHS to go private, for you to pay out of your own pocket for your treatment, as opposed to a free health care for everyone. You know, this, this is the direction that they've been trying to push for a, for a long time. And so there's some people who just cannot afford to go private. They just cannot. They cannot. And, and we don't want an American-style system, but we know 
that these private companies want an American style system. We know that they are paying politicians big money to influence and push towards that agenda. But they're being very careful at how they say and the way they perpetrate it. But we know they want privatization in the healthcare sector. And I'm here to tell you, we don't want any privatization in the healthcare. We just want investment going into the NHS and staying in our national healthcare service and not getting distributed elsewhere, which is exactly what they're doing. And as far as social care goes, guys, um, I, all, I strongly believe that our social care um, should have its own, should have like, should work in, in a way like the National Healthcare Service. There should be a National Social Care Service and, and a S, 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 H, uh, C kind of SHC for initials, a, a National Social Care Service of some sorts. Um, that um, that we were paying to like like we do with the NHS. I think we should have something like that. Um, but again, as great as an idea as it may or may not sound to some people, that will never happen because again, privatization, marketing, capitalist corporations, all that stuff, guys. That they all have to play a part in all of this for some reason when they're supposed to be looking after us. And I feel like I feel like there's there's little there's little little hope right now. Um, with the Conservatives right now and what Labour are planning to do. Um, I don't have much confidence in this at all at the moment. So a damning new survey reveals that less than a quarter of people are still satisfied with the NHS as satisfaction levels around social care are also hitting a all-time low. Satisfaction levels around social care were the worst ever recorded. The Nutfeld Trust noted with just 13% of people questioning, thinking they were acceptable. The annual analysis of By the King's Fund and Nutfield Trust in the past year, the British Social Attitude Survey, the BSA, carried out by the National Care for Social Research, NatKen, in 2023, and released in March 27th, makes grim reading for anyone who values the NHS and wants it to survive and thrive. In the survey's 41-year history, it was the first year in that less than a quarter of people were very or quite satisfied with the NHS. This peaked in 2010 and in the last year of the Tony Blair Gordon Brown government when 7 out of 10 people were satisfied. The fall to 24% was from 29% in 2022 and 53% as recently as 2020. So you can see here guys, this is um, this is um, uh, Byline Times has here. So figure one, public satisfactory with the NHS in 1983 to 2023. The question asked, asked in all, how satisfied or dissatisfied would you say you are with, in the way in which the National Healthcare Service runs nowadays? So blue is very or quite satisfied. Grey is neither satisfied or dissatisfied. And red is very or quite dissatisfied. So I would say you can see there, obviously, in the periods of 1989 to 1991, <coughs> it was very dissatisfying. In uh, 1995 to 1997, it was very unsatisfying. But you can see um, there are obviously 1999 to 2001 um, was pretty was above. So there were periods back in the 90s where it wasn't. But after 2000 or so, 2003 onwards, <coughs> you can see there's a satisfaction was very very good. In 2010, right before the Conservatives took over, was at its highest. A 70 there and the gap between the two was always quite high there <coughs> um, and then of course um, it's changed obviously since 29 uh, since 2019 2020 the satisfaction obviously has changed there here so just as a reference there on the bottom there, the new survey and public satisfaction in the NHS and social care has revealed some of the worst statistics ever recorded. This photo is from the Nutfield Trust and the, the King's Fund, just for reference there as well. <coughs> I do apologise, but my voice is starting to crack up a bit. I always start to crack up when I get go this far, guys. So the top reasons for respondents' dissatisfaction were long waits for GPs and hospital appointments, 71% staff shortages and 54%, and the view that the government does not spend enough on the health service, 47%. Respondents' top priorities for change were making it easier to get GP appointments, 52% and increase the number of staff in the NHS, 51%. Improved waiting times for planned operations was next at 47% and a and in 45%. Every year since 2015, a majority of respondents have said the government does not spend enough on the healthcare service, but this has hit a new peak of 84%. Uh, 
Among half of the respondents, uh, 48% would support the government increasing taxes and spending more on the NHS. <coughs> this that view is the most prevalent with people with the highest income household income. While 42% felt taxation and spending should remain the same, some 6% uh, wanted cuts. Of those satisfied with the level of service, the top person, the top reason was because the NHS care is free at the point of use, 66%, <coughs> it by having a good range of services and treatments available, 53%, and quality of care, 52%. The BSA results come just weeks after the annual NHS staff survey was mirrored public attitude, attitudes. The 2023 survey, which received a massive response for over 50%, showed that 30% of respondents felt uh, burnt out by their work, and 34% found it emotionally exhausting. Just over 57% said their organisation took positive action on health and uh, well-being. Less than half felt to meet the conflicting demands of their work, and only a third felt their workplace had enough staff for them to do their job properly. A quarter said they never faced unrealistic unrealistic pressures for some reason a spider decided to try and uh, drop right on top of me but uh, yeah I just fl flicked it away <laughs> yeah in case you were wondering what I was doing just there um, it's fine don't worry I didn't I didn't hit it just hit its web these are just conditions to create more distances where staff come into work every day unable to deliver the professional standards of care uh, of uh, they want to knowing that they are letting uh, parents down but constrained by a system lacking resources capacity and staff a quarter of NHS workers said they have been subject to harassment abuse or bullying from members of the public and another 28% had experienced it from managers and colleagues only a half of those workers said they had reported such incidences only 54% of those surveyed believe their organisation acted without discrimination and with fairness regarding career progression yet we still have ridiculous weaponization. By the right of culture was about equality, diversity, inclusive politics, training, and a handful of designated staff to manage these clearly needed work. <coughs> it is especially concerning after a whole series of public care failings, scandals, and inquiries, and both professional duty of candor and transparency for clinical staff, and statutory duty of candor for organisation leaders, that only 62% of respondents felt safe speaking about speaking up about concerns affecting patient safety in their organisations and 50% believe those concerned should listen or to or acted by managers. Most concerning of all was the finding that only 61% of respondents would recommend their organisation is a place of work and only 64% would recommend it as a place for their family and friends to receive care. Is anyone surprised that the NHS has such a retention problem with so many clinical staff leaving or signalling their intent to leave? The social care crisis is even more pressing. The annual skill for care report on the state of the social care sector and workforce for 2023 showed that one in 10 posts were unfulfilled and serious problems with retention due to poor terms, conditions and support compounded by the impact of immigration rules, pay and competing sectors on recruitment. This along with a growing crisis on social care and local government funding is making provisions unviable. No wonder public satisfaction with social care is so low, further compounded by it being heavily rash, uh, rash, rationed and means tested, with the government repeatedly ducking sustainable solutions and growing gaps between requests for assessment, care and support and with their provision. What strikes me about these two surveys is that the staff experience, also in an all-time low over the past two years survey, and public satisfaction are so closely aligned. The staff know they are working in a broken system. Close to a cliff edge, this close critical uh, transition point from which there may be no return. The public see it and it's no fun working in a service that the patients and family are so unhappy with. All this gloom, there are some points of hope and unity. The overwhelming majority of BSA respondents express high levels of support for the founding principles of the NHS when they, if they should still apply in 2023. That should be free of charge when you need it, 91%. Primary funded through taxation, 82%, and available to everyone, 82%. There is no clamour for a sea change in fundamental mechanisms or a shift to market-based provision or competition. As for the staff survey, commitment to the NHS values and spirits remains strong. Nearly 9 in 10 staff thought their role made a difference to patients, and 7 in 10 said the care of patients were of their organisation's top priority. This year's survey showed little difference between what Conservatives and Labour voters want to see changed. So if you think politicians would be pushing an open door and act on voters' priorities and the commitments of the staff who are keeping on keeping on 
even after the traumas of COVID. I mean, it's it's still very worrying to say the least. Some of the numbers, without a shadow of a doubt, um, it's good that there are still lots of many people like myself who who believe in the NHS and want the NHS to succeed. And and it does uh, worry me when we um, that the, that there are outside influences trying to change our national healthcare service and try to push this agenda that the NHS doesn't work. Oh, it's not working. We need to. Yeah, what what we have doesn't work. It needs reform and and whatnot. No, it's, you know we don't need privatisation. The system we had has always been satisfactory. The only problem is is that is that politicians have been influenced by big businesses and corporations to get their muddy hands on our NHS data and whatnot. <clears throat> it's not perfect, but it's one of the best health. It's not perfect, but it has been one of the best healthcare services in the world back in 2010, and now it's in the situation it's in because of the last 14 years of conservatives running down the funding, the austerity measures that they impose. It has always been poorer under the Conservatives than it has been under Labour. And I don't like the Labour's premises for using private using the private care private sector to to build back up the NHS. Um you know, it, you know, can you know do we honestly believe West Streeting is going to allow the private sector to invest in our NHS and then disconnect the private sector with the NHS? No, I don't believe that for a damn second. I really, really don't. Because that's what he made with that intentional comment when he said we want, we need to invest, we need the private sector to invest so that we can less rely on the private sector. And I'm like, yeah, sure, okay. Like, I'm very having a very hard time believing that. I don't care what Victoria Atkins, the health secretary, says because whatever she says, she'd, she'll just say whatever the... the puppet government line will say anyway so you can't take her role seriously anyway as a health secretary in any way shape or form guys but what do you think ollie um are you a lot happier today he's a lot happier now he's a lot happier the lava lamp has uh, formed um the orb is there in all its glory so he's a lot happier why is he a lot happier guys because we've reached the end of regan's news round guys i want to say a massive thank you to everyone who's watched any premiere chat what did you guys think of uh, some of the stories we covered today? From talking about the peers, Peter Mandelson on Brexit, raw sewage spills. Let me know what your thoughts about these stories, guys, in the comments section down below. If you found any of these videos interesting, please hit the like button. be greatly appreciated. Share this across social media so others are notified of this video. And subscribe because it really does help support the channel. And if you want to financially support me in the work I do here, you can do so by becoming a YouTube member for as little as 99p. Or join me on Rumble or Patreon for exclusive content there as well. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope to catch you all very, very soon.